Well, the problem is, is that, that these kids really love natural science, and then what happens is it's getting killed. And what is it getting killed by? It's getting killed by our education system. Uh, after looking at ants in the garden or, or, or sitting in a swing and thinking that, oh, that's, that swing is actually a pendulum, for example, uh, what happens is they get into school and as soon as they start learning about natural science in school, stuff gets boring. It becomes what we call chalk physics. Everything is really abstract. Everything is really um, uh, textbook, uh, object A, object B, really boring. So a lot of students are turning away from, from natural science. And, uh, and this, is a, this is a problem. This is basically a crisis. And I know everyone is hearing crisis every day. Now here's another one for you. This is also crisis because what the problem is is that the basis of all engineering subjects is natural science. And what did we do? We created uh, a piece of software uh, which is, we are not saying that this is going to solve the problem. This is, this is going to be one step towards uh, a healthier uh, uh, mentality in education, let's put it this way. It's a webcam based natural science observation and exploration laboratory. All you need is a, is a simple webcam. There's nothing else you need. And for example, this is one of the six functions. It's called kinematics. Uh, there's the little webcam in front. The software recognizes the object and follows the movement characteristics of the, uh, of the object. And then you can diagram the movement and you can do a, a pendulum experiment. You can do a collision experiment, a free fall experiment. Um, since you don't need anything, kids can have a copy of the software at home. So what they can do is get uh, homework, for example, from, um, from their teachers. Uh, they can do, for example, the pendulum experiment that I just showed you, and do the same thing in the kitchen at home, collect the data, bring it to class, and they can discuss why the data that they collected is different compared to the one that the teacher had. And they learn the, um, the natural science phenomenon without even knowing what it's called. So actually, the teacher can tell them later that it's, for example, I don't know, Newton's first law, they learn it, learn what happens first. Um, right from the beginning, we knew that we were going to have to build up the distribution network, and we knew that it's going to be hard. So we had one goal uh, that we basically looked at companies around the world and trying to find a, find a way where there's a great match between the software itself and some kind of hardware that's on the market. And we identified a company called Intel, we said, oh, maybe three, four years from now, we have a good chance to be at least discussing this uh, with Intel one day. Once we are really successful, once we have millions of deployments around the world, uh, then, the, then we will have a good chance to show them a, you know, a good value proposition and, and try to uh, discuss this with them. Um, what life brought to us is a different situation. Uh, we have been in the Intel Learning Series Alliance for, for about a year, uh, but we started discussions uh, early last year uh, with Intel, which, which ended uh, in uh, signing a contract for the core stack. So, so this, is, this is like the, the trophy for us. A lot of people think that if you want to speak to a large multinational, you go to their local office, you talk to someone, and then they forward your email to someone uh, uh, in the headquarters, and then they will contact you, and this is how it works. This never works this okay. way. You have to have, uh, you have to be there. Okay. So if you want to, if you want to, if you want to create contacts for yourself in the Silicon Valley, you have to go there. Okay. Dan is combining Hungarian designs, uh, and he, he took the designs uh, in Hungary and uh, other European countries uh, to be uh, contract manufactured in China, and then brought them back uh, to Europe. Uh, I think he made a lot of money during the process. What I wanted to speak about today, actually, is um, not so much my stuff, but about um, changes that I see in, in, in this model. And the model is uh, one that everybody uses, from Apple to Philips to, you know, to small companies like myself. Um, so China is a contract manufacturing source. Uh, and then structural changes taking place in China now, and how those changes are impacting the way things are, are going to work a bit in the future. The system uh, as, it, as it stands is companies design and marketing, and in the middle is Chinese contract manufacturer. Um, and I think that's going to start to change.
limitless supply of cheap labor, um, low employment rights, low employee rights, uh, low environmental regulation, um, corrupt local government officials who, who have been very much in favor of helping the, the factories grow, and, um, and a stable currency and low cost credit. And uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan, Taiwanese businessmen that I know call this the, the golden age of manufacturing in China. And that's kind of over now. In fact, uh, in Guangdong province, there's not a limitless supply of cheap labor. They have labor shortages in Guangdong province. With 1.3 billion people, they're having labor shortages. And, and, and the reason is that um, most of the labor that was coming there was migrant labor from the countryside. And it was mostly 17, 18, 19 year old young ladies who would go and work in the factories. But now, as the rest of China has developed, a couple of things have happened. One, they've got factories closer to home to go to rather than Guangdong province. Or even more so, they don't want to work in a smelly, dirty factory anymore. They can work in the service sector. So you don't have as much labor. And, and um, some of the Chinese factories are actually shutting down production lines simply because they can't get workers. Um, so, so in, wages are going up, um, employee rights, the employees are starting to unionize and, and, and group together. Um, government officials are no longer so much on side because the land the factory sits on is now more, worth more than the factory itself. So they can rip down that factory, move the factory somewhere else, and build a luxury high rise that a condo is there and, and do much better for themselves from that. What's going to happen? I think the factories that are remain are going to adapt. Uh, and they're going to move up the value chain into computers. A lot of them are moving to LED lighting. And this whole massive amount of factories that are making uh, low-tech goods, most of them are going to disappear. Uh, they'll move out, or they'll just go bankrupt. And then the other, other factories that will serve the domestic market rather than serving the export market. All the growth is internal now. And the Chinese have good enough local wages to, to support uh, factories on their own. And so as they support their own domestic economy, they'll grow their own brands. So they won't be so much export focused as the, the, the main uh, raison d'etre, but the, rather domestic market and then some export business. What does that mean for people like me? Uh, what that means is, and people like you, in fact, well, my costs go up. My costs have gone up by 30% in the last three years on China-made products. Uh, and I try to pass that cost on where I can, but you can't always do that. Uh, costs will go up and then uh, production will come back here. I think, I think there's a great opportunity for Central Eastern Europe to, to start to take uh, local products uh, and, and make them here, yeah, both for small manufacturers like myself and bigger ones. And, and then longer term, I'd say, just in closing, I think uh, the net effect of this is going to be Chinese companies will create their own brands to serve the domestic market, they'll grow those brands, They'll have a huge installed base of customers, and then they'll come west. Eight years ago, I was approached uh, by one of my friends who uh, had an idea for an invention. It was a big wheel, and it had two pedals on each side. And uh, he asked me to help him. I was a young product designer student at the time. Um, and uh, so to work on this idea, I started to look for a mass production company, a factory, a licensee, manufacturing licensee. And my idea was that if I take this product to China and I get it manufactured by a Chinese firm, then uh, that's a great thing because then I skip the middleman. So instead of going to a big firm and asking them to, to make it for me, I go direct to the factory. Because uh, as we learned today, everything is made in China, so why not go to China directly? Um, actually, it was much easier to convince a Chinese firm to invest into a new invention then it would be to, uh, to um, convince a Western firm to invest into a new invention because new inventions are very risky because it takes years and several product generations to get them right, to, to uh, get them ready. And it takes a lot of money to make them successful in the market. Uh, Western firms, for this reason, are very, very cautious with new, new products because they think in shorter terms. Actually, the, the problem is more uh, at the management level. In China, it's uh, very difficult to find a good engineer because there's a shortage. A half a million engineers graduate in China each year, but there's still a shortage. 
So a good engineer is very expensive, and, and I never met a fa factory person who would afford a good engineer. So Hungarian should go to China now, mm -hmm. if they have engineer background. Actually, you can make uh, a lot more money as an engineer in China at the moment, yes. I say that in China, maybe 100 million or over 100 million electric scooters are used. In the industrial areas, that's what people use as primary transport. Um, so I try to analyze how come these are not being sold in Europe. In China, we have everything right, so scooters sell in Europe. Um, Chinese brands are not appropriate, and Western brands are not ready to enter the market. So the business concept which we thought of with Powell's team is to take the uh, scooter parts from China and to fix them, fix the scooter, make it appropriate for Europe. So we would take a scooter, we would dress it up, dress it into European style clothing, um, put nice European designs cover bits on it. Um, all the parts would come from one supplier. The assembly would be in Hungary. Um, we would design a nice marketing package for it. We would market the product for digital generation. We would enter trade shows with this well-designed, uh, Hungarian-assembled, well-assembled product. And uh, we would establish an exclusive trade network, similarly to the gas wheel, whereas in each European country, we would have one appointed exclusive distributor, and he would be distributing and marketing, advertising our actual scooter, which would be marketed as a European product, as it would be actually assembled in Hungary, um, and the design would come from Hungary as well. The reason why this project would be feasible is that Chinese brands already put all the money and time into developing the technology behind electric scooters. So we wouldn't start from zero, such as BMW. We would take an existing technology, we take existing parts, and we would only put a marketing behind it. So that would keep our investment in money and time very minimal. Now, talking about uh, new markets, since innovation in healthcare is so expensive, new mark for new markets there is an access problem. They just cannot afford all, all, all this innovation. Uh, we talked about the difficult course of adapting innovation, how long it takes because of all these stakeholders involved. Uh, care is very fragmented. You go to different, uh, uh, if you have a health problem, you go to one organization, then you have to go to another one. These, talk, uh, these two don't talk to each other. In general, we can say that there is very bad flow of information. Information is used in a very bad way in healthcare. And uh, we don't do prevention. We may talk about it, but we don't do prevention. We cure illnesses. We don't prevent uh, 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 the healthy from becoming sick. Now, for all these reasons, uh, my statement here is that innovation in, in, in our world today must consider all the stakeholders aspects. Now, let's get back to that chart I've shown before, and let's see what the stakeholders aspects are. You have the producers, manufacturers, they want to make money, right? Uh, you have the regulators, what they want is no problems. Okay? No problems. Not necessarily uh, favorite innovation. Uh, the payers want to save money, right? The buyers, the consumers, they want access. They want access, they want to be cured, and they want the best treatment possible, whatever it costs. And then the poor doctors who is prescribing, you know, uh, the consumers are pushing them, on the one hand, to, uh, to, to, to do whatever they can. The payers are pushing them from the other side not to spend too much money. So, if, if I have to make just one word, using a blunt word here, what innovation should be like in our times, it should be cheap. It should be accessible, it should be cheap. It should be easy to use and easy to access. Um, there's a lot of new technology out there, technology that we use in other areas, but technology that uh, uh, has a hard time uh, uh, also bringing about innovation in healthcare. Uh, some examples are gene analysis, bioinformatics, robotics, uh, the internet, mobile internet, social media. <coughs> and there's a company called IBG Star in, the, in California that came up with a blood glucose meter 
that you can connect to the iPhone. Actually, you drop your blood on this device, like you see it on this picture, and then it automatically comes up with your data. Now, very importantly, the data that you have, number one, are systemized, so you can look up your data historically. It is stored in an intelligent way. And secondly, you can also share it. You can share it with your doctor. You can call your doctor, hey, this is the result I have. Actually, there is a urine test now. There's a chip you actually have to pee on, and you have to insert it to your iPhone, and you get the same uh, test results that are, again, uh, connectable. Now, these are examples that show how uh, the patients can become more informed and, uh, and, and elevated. A company called Movisante in, uh, in, in the US, the, the gentleman you see here, has developed the iPhone ultrasound. It's the device that you see there. And uh, the, the way they advertise it on their website is they say it is convenient, it is accessible, it is connected, and it is affordable. This device costs something like seven to $8,000. And it is, uh, it is a very good ultrasound. You can easily spend $100,000 on an ultrasound. There is even a thing uh, this gentleman, uh, a British gentleman, has developed uh, called Peter Bentley. It's an eye stethoscope. You can use your iPhone as a stethoscope, put it to different parts of your body. And not only do you hear, but you have to hear, but you also see it on your screen. Now, you may think of all this stuff like, you know, this is gadgets. But think of this. This guy claims that this application has been downloaded by 3 million doctors already. Let's move away from the iPhone. Uh, let's go into 3D printing. A couple of months ago, uh, the first uh, uh, organ has been printed by a 3D printer. It is a jaw uh, uh, of an old lady. And you see the device here. So like you have in, in other industrial applications, you design something on your, on your computer and then you push a button and it is printed. Okay, it takes a couple of hours still. Uh, what percentage of hospitals in the United States have electronic medical records? What percentage of the hospitals store the data electronically in a, in a consistent way? Yeah, I hear one, 10, it's 20%. It's a shame. Uh, uh, the others have either uh, uh, strange systems or paper-based systems. Now, in some countries in Europe, the situation is better, like in Sweden or in, or in Holland. But still, uh, you know, can you think of any other industry uh, where uh, uh, IT is at such a low level? So uh, electronic medical record is actually, uh, is actually a big thing. Now, this is one of our innovations at Medicover, uh, robotic limbs. People who have lost limbs, you know, have robotic arms and legs, okay? That's one thing. The other thing is uh, uh, wearable robots, exoskeletons they are called, for people who are, who are paralyzed. They wear this and uh, they start to walk. This uh, company in uh, Silicon Valley, Exobionics, their motto is get out of your wheelchair and walk. And these devices already work. Now, think of this. The brain-computer interface, it's, uh, this is a penny. This is how big it is. This is an invasive surgery. It's, it's in a clinical trial period, but it's coming. Uh, they insert this electrode into your brain, where your motion uh, 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 sensors are in, of, of your brain. And uh, it detects uh, what you want to do. So with the help of this device, you can actually you know, you think of something and you can move cursors on a computer, or you can also uh, uh, move these uh, exoskeletons that I have just shown. Okay? And this is in clinical period phase, so this is coming. Watch out for it. Okay, to conclude, there is um, the human genome. You know, it's uh, more than 10 years old since, uh, it's been 10 years since the code has been cracked, and some people are disappointed. You know, they were thinking that uh, a lot of medical innovation will come within years. Uh, think about this. The first uh, uh, genome that was cracked, it cost hundreds of millions of, of dollars. Now, they say that in about less than one year's time, you can get your genome for $1,000. In two, three years' time, it will be $100. Now, I have checked last night when preparing for this presentation that you already have companies like Decode Me and uh, 23andMe where you can buy your genome, not, not the whole thing, but, but parts of it. 
and then it tells you what your risk factors are. For example, what's your risk factor in heart attack compared to the average? And uh, so what this tells you is, okay, I have this risk factor. I, I, I can consult with my doctor. Uh, I can change my lifestyle, right? And, and the insurance companies are going to ask for that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We will. Yeah. Uh, and this actually you can get now for as, uh, uh, as low amount as $200. So, uh, Okay, I hope I was fast enough. This is the end of my presentation. Actually, uh, uh, my birthday is soon coming, and I just told to my wife last night that I, I want this for my birthday. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you.